G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with part two of The Outsiders. First dog on the moon, and I might even get a bit of time to rant as well. Like the passers by who comes across uh, something that has happened in the street and decides whether they want to intervene or not. Now, we are intervening, we have been intervening in the Middle East for the last hundred years or more uh, in much more fundamental ways than the one we are debating now. For all the drama, of what we are debating now, and I don't want to reduce the seriousness of the decision to go to war or not, but for all of that, we are intervening in much more fundamental ways. Let me just give an example. One, one question that occupies a lot of people in the Arab world um, and, and, and occupies people who are interested in the Arab world is why is it that there's so much hopelessness and stagnation and unemployment in the Arab world despite the incredible wealth that is there? Now, obviously, there's no easy answer to this. But certainly part of the answer is that, the most obvious one, is that where the concentration of population exists in the Arab world, which is in North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean, is not where the uh, concentration of oil wealth is. So there's, 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 there's a spatial separation between the two. But another part of the answer, an important part of the answer, is how that oil wealth is spent. Now, let me give you some figures, just some, 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 some data. In um, in, well, I was working on, part, on, on a project with, the, for, with, 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 with other colleagues for the, for the Lancet Journal, uh, looking at problems of sustainable development in the Arab world. And um, we looked at uh, the military expenditures by Arab countries between 2001 and 2012. Uh, this, is, this is the period in the, uh, 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 in the 21st century that we had access to the data for, on, on, on the database, database of the World Bank. Yep. Um, and the figure is $1.2 trillion. Now, if you add the expenditure on weapons by the other three regional powers in the area, which is Israel, Iran, and, 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 and Turkey, it reaches $1.5 trillion. Now, that's the GDP, the yearly GDP of Australia. Uh, that is half the GDP, roughly, of uh, uh, Germany. We looked at how much um, uh, the Arab world spends on health compared to its expenditure on weapons. We looked at all the other regions in the world as well, um, and we found every single other region in the world spends roughly about four times on health than it does on weapons. The point, 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 point being that our intervention could potentially be, if we, if we were to intervene, and, and your thoughts on this, Jim, if we were to intervene, would we not better do it rather militarily than by urging some sort of constructive social change? Well, I'm, I'm hearing two things here. On the one hand, you, you have you had these these distasteful dictators in place in Libya, still in Syria, and Egypt, and they were moderately successful at keeping a lid on things, but in a very distasteful way. If you come in and knock them out, it would see, it seems that you give rise to some of the worst elements of the most extreme camp. And so, on the one hand, we're hearing that maybe we shouldn't have intervened in Libya because what a disaster that is. Says Sarah, she's right. Uh, you can't get a vote to go into Syria. Uh, and on the other hand, we're hearing that uh, when we leave these horrible dictators in place, surprise, surprise, they spend money on their family and themselves, and they don't really spend it on the uh, bulk of the population. Correct. Mm. I mean, we live in a world where you don't get to have the utopian choice. Now, I see the argument for leaving these, these guys in place, very distasteful. I see the argument for knocking them out. There's, there's, there's cost to doing either one. And we can, you know, we can debate that, although I'm sure nobody cares what we say, but you can debate that, but it's not as if you make a call and it's all going to be good choices. It's not. And yet the certainty, Sarah, seems to be that we, we as we saw this week, the, the, you know, the local threat, the, the local risk of, of terror outside of resolving anything in the Middle East, we, we in, inflame the local threat by our participation over there. I think that's true. Uh, I don't agree with what uh, the Prime Minister and uh, the opposition leader have been saying this week, that they do this because they hate our freedoms and they're sort of somehow jealous. Uh, it does appear that some of the worst acts have allegedly been motivated by Western foreign policy. The 7-7 bombers in London made videos to that effect and it appears to have been the motivation of um, people like Ben Breaker and so on. Uh, it is. Uh, to, to clarify, I, again, I'm not saying that our foreign policy has to be adjusted to appeal to extremists, but it certainly sounds like it to me, sir. That sounds exactly like what you're saying. Well, thanks very much, Jim. But it's 
it's it's a consideration when we're not sure exactly what else our foreign policy is actually going to achieve. Have we worked out about the answer here? I mean, do, do we do we, do we have policy that yes, the framework that might work? I think um, uh, very quickly because we're running out of time. The answer, the answer, uh, 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 you know, I think the answer should be that uh, foreign policy um, uh, uh, should not be dictated by the interest of. Um, uh, uh, that, are, that, that, are, that are generated by selling weapons to the, to the Middle East. Yeah, and most, of these, most of these military expenditures that I was talking about end up creating defense jobs in the United States of America. Thank, Thank you to all of that. We, we uh, sadly have to rush to uh, First Dog on the Moon, who is waiting for us with, with, with great impatience. Sarah Joseph, Abbas El Zane, and Jim Allen have been your outsiders this morning. <laughs> Settle down, settle down. That's enough. Good morning, 6A. End of the term is almost upon us. And as you know, it's time for your final marks. Now, some of you have excelled and some of you have not. Let me first say that here at St. On the Moon School for Overbearing Boys, we pride ourselves not just on our academic rigor, but also our capacity to deliver a sound thrashing to a first year with a polo mallet with one hand while drinking a litre of Tanqueray with the other. Leadership community and service. These are our watchwords. I do have to say, though, that this year has been a bit of a disappointment. Quite a lot, actually. Full of good intentions, most of the class, however, became distracted by your enthusiasm for tormenting the first years. Of course, that would have been fine, except it got out into the press. We do, however, have an excellent school PR department. So the problem is your lack of discipline, which is also reflected in your marks. We'll start at the top, shall we? Abbott T. Finally made head boy and we expected great things, but you spent most of the term telling everyone that the students from the nearby Islamic college were planning to burn down the bike shed. Not your fault, of course. We should never have let them build their school in the same suburb. B minus. Andrews K. Uh, kicking people while they're down. Boys, that was the name he gave to his final year term paper, and it was a marvellous example of the kind of work we expect from a student in his senior year, A+. Plus. Uh, Betts E spent most of the semester cackling like a loon and throwing darts at pictures of Airedale puppies. Not particularly good results academically, but certainly overqualified for cabinet. B+, plus as well. Uh, Bishop B spent most of the term adjudicating the debate club. Uh, it was very entertaining, although democracy wasn't really the winner, was it, Bishop? Uh, A+, plus, well done. Brandis G, aside from the remedial information technology classes, you've excelled in every area, Brandis. Pretty much hated by fellow students and teachers alike, so A+, plus there. Dutton uh, P, I didn't even realise you were in this class, boy. Are you sure you go to this school? C-, minus. Hockey J, Hockey. This year started with so much promise, I can only think that the way you've thrown yourself into your duty as tuck shop monitor has distracted you from your studies. Yes, hockey, I understand it's everyone else's fault, but that's not the point. Stop sulking, boy, and sit up straight. C minus. Hunt C. Oh, no, I mean G. Uh, Hunt, gardening club's not just about pesticides and weed killer, boy. You actually need to grow something. Otherwise, well done. C minus. Joyce B. Always on time, always sits at the front of the class. I haven't understood a single word you've said all year, my lad. Top work. A minus. Morrison S. A B plus. Impressed with your work overall, however, the incident at the rowing sheds, for the first time in the history of St. On the Moons, the school eight were in a winning position when you waded out to, what was it, stop the boats? What were you thinking, boy? And setting the chap on a drift on the school dinghy, it's lucky no one drowned. B plus. McFarlane I, well done boy, quite achiever academically, and a unique contribution to the chamber choir. Matron still hasn't recovered, so A+, plus. Pine Minor, uh, it took guts to go out for the first 15, Pine, real guts. Especially that attempt to spear tackle young hockey, and well done extricating your head as quickly as you did. Points for trying, and let's just hope that the dramatic society is some sort of compensation. Your Porsche was memorable, B-. minus. 
Uh, trust mm. W. Sit up, boy, and pay attention. For goodness sake, half the faculty don't even know you're a student here, and do try to stop bumping into things. D. Finally, Turnbull M. Uh, get that smug grin off your face, my lad, and put down the iPad. You're too clever by half. This has been First of the Moon's Guide to Modern Living, proudly brought to you by the First of the Moon Institute. Okay, well, with regard to this uh, 870 cops raiding 25 locations and detaining 15 people and then actually charging one person with having received a telephone call, or perhaps made a telephone call, but a telephone call was definitely involved, during which the person who's been charged actually spoke about thinking about planning to conduct a demonstration killing of a random Australian plucked from the streets of Sydney. And uh, I have no doubt that such a conversation took place. I'm also aware that all 15 people who were detained were individuals who'd had their passports cancelled in May, no, March, that's right, passports cancelled in March because they were considered likely to want to fly out of Australia, go to the Middle East and take part in some kind of jihadist insurgency. Therefore, they were kept in Australia and forced to fester in the suburbs. And conveniently, they were being monitored intensively for months and months and months and then on the day that Prime Muppet Ababot dispatched 600 Australians to go and get involved in fighting against the forces of anti-God in the Iraqi desert and perhaps the Syrian landscape as well, that was the day that the raids were carried out. What a marvellous coincidence that next week which I, I personally believe the passports were cancelled in order to orchestrate the social pressure in order to foment the rebelliousness and, and, and generate the plots so that the plots could be foiled so that next week when they go into parliament and they debate the idea of extending or curtailing Johnny Howard's anti-terrorist provisions, instead of the forces of the Australian way of life, free speech, free liberty, the right to free movement, freedom of association um, they were going to say yeah but you've had these laws on the books for 10 years and you've never needed to use them they go what's the point in keeping them now they're going to be able to go in there and say oh yes but there was one person who planned to kill somebody with friends using a blade and as the previous documentary which i did not record mentioned there's, there's one man kills his wife every week in australia or kills his partner every week in australia and if a man walked into a kindergarten and shot three children and, and then shot the female school teacher, that would be considered a classroom massacre. But when a farmer kills his wife and three kids and then kills himself, that's considered, you know, like a really nice bloke who was a life and soul and pillar of the community and he was under stress. So I question the priorities in worrying quite so much about terrorists. I think it's because Tony Abbott always had an agenda and part of his agenda was to bring in conditions which would allow him to create a police state, a state of surveillance. And that's what he has done and is doing. In the meantime, he's making every disaffected Muslim in the world angry with Australia. And it appears that our 200 Special Air Service Regiment troops are going to be the boots on the ground so that Barack Obama is able to say there's no American boots on the ground as the long range patrol, forward air controllers, calling in the airstrikes of any Air Force who wants to go and pot a few wops with towels on their head. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.